These are Nebraska corn farmers. They work in acres, not hours, harvesting the energy and climate solutions the world needs. We are proud to stand with you. The success of tomorrow's soy industry depends on the actions we take today. The future is here, and the time to move is now. Market Journal, Television for Agricultural Business Decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, in partnership with the Nebraska Rural Radio Association. Promotional support provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and partial funding provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Hello everyone, I'm Alex Makovica. Thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. We're officially entering the home stretch of the growing season. So coming up this week on Market Journal, we'll be discussing late season and final irrigation tips with extension irrigation specialist, Steve Melvin, as well as getting a check on the markets with the president of Heartland Farm Partners, that's Jeff Peterson. Eric Hunt is also on standby with your weekly weather forecast, but we'll begin here this week. Indonesia is Southeast Asia's largest economy, the world's fourth most populous country, and it offers substantial economic development opportunities for the state of Nebraska. Indonesia is also one of the top 10 export markets for Nebraska at nearly $140 million. A Nebraska trade delegation led by Nebraska Lieutenant Governor Joe Kelly recently returned home from a trade mission to Indonesia. We were able to sit down with Nebraska Secretary of Ag Sherry Vinton to discuss how that trip turned out. Here's our conversation from Monday morning. What was this trip really all about? Tell us more about that. Well, gosh, Alex, thanks for the opportunity. You know, this trip was about creating a new market for Nebraska. We already have some exports to Indonesia, but it's a country of 280 million people. Their average age is well under 40, and they have growing income levels. So it's important as an agricultural powerhouse that Nebraska is, that we find new and expanded markets for our products. Okay, let's learn about Indonesia's landscape, about how they use Nebraska agriculture. What does that look like right now? Well, some of their top products are feed grains. Of course, they use soybeans, soybean meal, and distiller's grains. They have a, a large poultry industry, aquaculture, and they need our, our products to feed their livestock. But one of the other things that could be a growing and expanding market would be ethanol. We visited the largest fuel retailer in Indonesia, Petromina, and we talked about how ethanol could help solve one of their huge problems. They have terrible air quality, some of the worst in the world, and clean burning ethanol is a great product for that at a good price point if we can get rid of the trade barriers. Mm -hmm. What are some other shortfalls for Nebraska agriculture in the Indonesian market? Well, we have a large tariff on beef as well, and so that would be something that we could look at. Um, and it is, it's a long ways, it's halfway around the world. So we need to make sure that we're competitive and we're providing the highest value added products that they would need. So that's going to mean meat and that's going to mean soybean meal, distiller's grain, more of a finished product there. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a lot of business, but you guys also had a little bit of fun on this trip. What were some trips and tours that stand out in your mind? Oh gosh, there were several highlights. You know, one of the highlights was opening of the ranch market. This was a, a food pavilion featuring USA products and specifically Nebraska beef in one of their huge malls that they have there. And we did a ribbon cutting and opened that event there. Another, another one of the great things that we did was Indaguna. They're the largest importer of beef in Indonesia. And we had a great event celebrating our partnership with them there as well. So we had some, some young farmers and ranchers with us and they demonstrated their roping skills and their, their dancing skills. And we highlighted our Western culture and our family culture because family is very important to Indonesians. Mm -hmm. And so they understood that we aren't corporate, we're families from the farm to the table. Mm -hmm. You were also sharing about uh, an influencer presence. Tell That's, us more about that. That's correct. We teed up this trip last summer. We had Dr. Hawkins 
and a couple of ranchers go over to Indonesia and they were highlighted on MasterChef Indonesia. And they actually had 20 million views for that. It's a huge, huge market. Once again, highlighting families and Western culture. And so this time they brought in a social influencer. His name's Boy William. And so we continued to build on that relationship and we're looking forward to actually bringing him in a film crew to Nebraska next year. Well, as we round out our conversation, Indonesia was the focus of this year's trade mission, but talk about the, the broader picture of trade for Nebraska in general. What does that look like? The broader picture is very important because as you know, we have less than 2 million people in Nebraska, but our farmers and ranchers are incredibly productive. We are an ag powerhouse and we need a variety of markets. We will we don't want to be overly reliant on one trading partner. We've seen what can happen then. So we want to expand our markets into new and growing markets that will be there now and in the future. A big thanks to Secretary Vinton for taking time to join us this week. Be sure to tune in next week. We'll get Lieutenant Governor Joe Kelly's full thoughts on that trade mission as well. Well, moving on from trade to educational opportunities, the 25th annual Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory Open House already just a week away. This annual event is a one of a kind event that should be on your radar for local cattle producers. Market Journal's Bill Dodd is standing by with more information on this year's event. Bill. Thanks, Alex. Coming up on Wednesday, August 21st is the Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory Open House. Now, for those that aren't familiar with the facility, it's located in the heart of the Nebraska Sandhills. And since its inception, Research and educational programs have become more ecologically diverse and team-oriented. Now, the overall goal of the Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory Open House is to bring together different facets of the cattle industry, including weather, marketing strategies, the latest in beef cattle research, and of course, peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities that just can't be found anywhere else. This year would be the 25th year we've had what we call an open house. Uh, prior to that, we had what we called field days when we had some research to report. But the open house was something we started back, uh, I believe, in 2000. And it's just become an annual event. It's a great way to come together, uh, local ranchers, uh, industry professionals, and just honestly just get to network with each other and hear what's going on in the industry. Um, one thing we're hoping to do a little bit this year is maybe take um, – some programs such as the Nebraska Ranch Practicum that's been a highlight here at Goodmanson. And we want to talk to some ranchers on a panel with the group about uh, how taking the ranch practicum has possibly helped them with their own ranching operations. Uh, we also are going to have what we call a historical panel. And we're actually quite lucky that some of those folks are actually going to join us that day. Um, and talk about some of the history of, of how Goodmanson Research came to be about. The other thing is we're going to try something new this year. Um, instead of having talks all day up on the screen with PowerPoint, we're going to have an hour and a half session in the morning with several different booths, you might say, or, or sessions. People can walk around, look at different components of uh, research that's taken place here. We'll have the Husker Mobile Beef Lab. Uh, we'll have some precision livestock management discussions. Uh, fly control is one other thing. We'll look at esophageally collected uh, diet samples. We just wanted to maybe showcase a wide range of research or things that tie back to research that have happened here at Goodmanson. Not only does this event offer the latest in beef cattle research and expertise, but lunch will also be provided for those who attend in person to make things even better, there is no cost to attend the event, and there will also be a live stream of the open house for those who can't make it. All you have to do is register and show up. Yes, we would love if people register, either whether you're gonna be attend in person or online. One, so we can make sure you get the link if you're gonna be online, and in person it helps us make sure we have enough food for lunch, so we appreciate people pre-registering. And to do that, you can visit the website go.unl.edu slash GSL open house, one word. As far as if you can't attend in person, we will have an online link. Granted, uh, maybe during the interactive sessions, we not, may not be able to be live, but when we have presentations going on here in the main room, um, we'll have those live and online. We are very thankful for the exhibitors that come to the open house. Their support helps pay for our noon meal and, and 
costs through the day. So we appreciate that. I just, uh, granted our sponsors pay for the lunch, but I joke with everyone, please come on out that day. I'd love to buy you lunch. So (laughs) (laughs) Uh, just to recap, the 25th annual GSL open house will be taking place on August 21st, beginning at 8 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time and adjourning at 3.30 p.m. We'll be sure to attach a direct link to the day's full itinerary and registration along with this story on the Market Journal website. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Back to you, Alex. All right. Thanks, Bill. Always a fun, informative time out there in the Sand Hills. So if you can get out there, it'll be well worth your trip. Up next, it's that time in the program to turn our attention over to the markets. A lot of movement happening earlier this week globally as the markets opened on Monday. We sat down with Heartland Farm Partners President Jeff Peterson earlier this week to see how things are shaping out in the green markets. Well, Jeff, thanks for joining us. As we sit here on Wednesday, I think it's fair that we need to start back on Sunday night into Monday where we saw stock markets absolutely plummeting. How did that impact corn and soybeans as we sit here and talk on Wednesday? Sure, there's a few things that happen. Anytime you have that pressure coming out of the stock market, it naturally causes everybody to get a little nervous. And and normally you have a little bit of selling off in the market. First place as we look is what happens to energy. And we did see a little bit of weakness happen over in the crude oil market. But surprisingly, Alex, that actually the markets held up pretty well, especially corn, considering what we had for outside pressure. So it puts a little wet blanket and now the market starts looking ahead again. Yeah, it's looking ahead to August 12th, which is the the next release of the WASDE report. As we sit here, do you think there will be any changes in corn and soybean acres and the numbers in this report? Yeah, I think it sure sets itself up for that. So a few things we want to kind of dig into. So if we think about it, when we see that basically the main numbers put together, that's all based off of survey data out of NAS, and that would be what the prospective planning report is. And then we get to the end of June and we see the planted acreage reports. Now, what was interesting this year is that there was some slow planning that was going on, and there was acres that was a little bit above normal that still had to be planted on corn and soybeans, mainly across South Dakota, Minnesota, and a few parts of Iowa. And what we didn't see them do is a special survey. So as we get to this year, everybody's really looking at those acres numbers saying, okay, could there be some changes? Now, what we also saw come out of NAS is NAS said they're gonna do something a little bit different this year. They're gonna feel like they're gonna incorporate the FSA data and the RMA data a little bit uh, more so than they would have in the past because they believe that they've got more data available this year than they would have had in the past. Not sure why that is, but that's where they're announcing. So as a result, when that information gets brought into the WASDE report, we think it'll have two impacts. We think it'll have an impact on the planted acreage. We also think it'll have an impact on the harvested acres. On corn, for instance, together, we think that could bring down the harvested acreage number about 1 to 1.5 million acres. And over on the soybean side, we think that could make about a 500,000 acre difference. So here on Market Journal, we've seen some producers who have experienced some severe hail damage. Really across the state of Nebraska saw a lot of this. Does that impact the numbers here in the WASD or is that too small of a scale to really make an impact? You know, here's how I always look at that is I, my heart goes out to those individuals that had that damage. And if it happened on your farm, it's very serious and it's very real. The challenging part we have is that usually every year, somewhere across the Corn Belt, whether it's an Eastern Corn Belt or the Western Corn Belt, we've got that type of damage. So unfortunately, it probably wasn't a big enough scale, even though there's some reports it could have been 450 or 500,000 acres, probably won't necessarily be a big enough impact to impact overall big picture of the WASDE, but what I can guarantee it will impact, it will impact the local basis in those areas as we get closer to harvest and see how those crops turn out. Okay, so potentially acres could be down, but what about yield and will that eventually just even off on those charts? Well, I tell you what, that's the million dollar question. So what's always interesting when we get to August, for one, it's a great time of the year. We've, we know we've got through really pollination with really, really good conditions. I, we've got a few areas that could have had a few problems, but the big difference is, is in the methodology. So let's talk about that. So when we have the May, June, and July reports that come out, those are all put together by the World Ag Outlook Board. You know, as part of the WASD group that puts together those numbers, they're working off of modeling on what they think the yields are gonna be. However, when we get to August, there's a change. And that change is, is that they hand that off to NAS the National Ag Statistics Service at both the national level and the state level. State level gets involved in you know, implementing the surveys. So what that looks like then is they'll survey about 15,000 farmers and they'll ask them how do they think their yields look. So they take that data. In addition, what they'll do is that they'll then look at satellite data and say, okay, how does the plant health compare to past years? And they'll bring that together and they'll come up with a yield. So a few things to kind of think about. 
Last year in the August report, the yield came in at 175.1. The year the yield ended up at 177.3. But so as a result, the yield came up as we went, but, but what we're really comparing back to is a 175.1. Now this year, okay, the, the yield we're starting off with is a 181. So the big question on everybody's mind is that, well, how does this really compare to last year? What we go back and look at, we look back and say, well, how does the crop condition data look? Well, you've got a 67% good to excellent rating on corn versus a 57% last year. And then over on the bean side, you've got a 58%, you know, and that's comparing back to it's a better number than what we'd have physically had last year. So overall, those conditions look good. Now, when we dig a little bit deeper, we say, well, can we get some insights into how the plant health looks? So when we look at that NDVI data, that plant health data, what it shows is that it is slightly better than it is last year. So it does look like we're gonna have, you know, some bigger yields coming in this next WASD report. Jeff, a wealth of information. All of this eventually comes down to grain marketing plans for our producers. What is important for them to keep in mind right now? Yeah, a couple things I think. So here's what we have to dig and dig into. So one, we have to go back and look at this old crop, right? So on the old crop side, they have to decide what they're going to do with it. You know, we, we've got some really good basis levels out there. And I think, you know, there's still bushels in the bands. And then like, you know, some of the past years we've had in Nebraska, maybe the yields have been off in areas, so they've been able to hold some of those bushels. But this year, they're probably going to need to get those moves. So I'd really encourage them on the old crop to get the bushels moved, at least on basis contracts. The big challenge really comes into the new crop. And what we really find on the new crop, we know for most everybody that they're below cost of production here. I would say for those bushels that have to move at harvest, really start doing your numbers, figuring out where your break evens are, figure out how much you're gonna have to physically move at harvest time. And then think about as we come into harvest here, if we get a little bounce in the market, then I'd say we need to go ahead and make some sales for the stuff that has to go in at harvest time. For anything that's post-harvest, I still think there's enough world problems out there that we'll get some better opportunities post-harvest to sell those bushels that you have in the bin. And thanks to Jeff for taking time this week to join us. Just a reminder, if you have a question you'd like to ask one of our guest analysts, feel free to email us or get in touch on social media. We'll be sure to pass those questions along. Well, from markets to weather, it's time now for our weekly weather forecast with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Eric Hunt. We've finally gotten a little bit of break from the heat this week. How are things shaping up for the week ahead? Thanks, Alice. This has, this has indeed been a welcome break from the heat. And thankfully, we'll continue for a couple more days. The temperatures will remain well below average across most of the central United States through Sunday into Monday. We will also have a chance of showers and thunderstorms across the state on Sunday. And again, later on Monday, we'll have a ridge across the southern United States and some trophic into the west. That's going to help kick off some showers and thunderstorms Monday afternoon and evenings in the High Plains region. That will be moving toward the east. So a good portion of the state actually can expect to pick up maybe a half inch to maybe an inch of precipitation as we move into Monday night into Tuesday. This will be very welcome news across portions of the southern Nebraska, which have really been very dry here in the last uh, month or so. As we move later in the week, that ridge will be building toward the north. That will bring the heat back up into portions of the state, particularly across eastern Nebraska, where we will likely see the highest getting well back in the 80s, maybe even the lower 90s across portions of southeastern Nebraska. And with the high humidity levels, the heat index will probably be back over 100 degrees in places like Beatrice, Nebraska, and Fall City by the end of the week, or by the end of Wednesday, sorry. As we move toward Friday, we will see troughing uh, move into the uh, High Plains region, at least according to the European model. And there's also going to be a chance for showers and thunderstorms to develop across central Nebraska, move their way east Thursday night into Friday, if the solution actually is correct. This is solution is not in the GFS. It's keeping ridging kind of in place over the central United States through the end of the week. Uh, so it's possible this will not, may not happen at all. But if it does, there's a good chance that eastern Nebraska may actually pick up some very beneficial rainfall by the end of this week. And if that does come to fruition, we we'll also see a decent cold front moving in, which will bring our temperatures back in the 70s and lower 80s to finish out the week, which will also be very welcome news. Uh, but later in the month, though, the PNA, which is the Pacific North American Oscillation, is showing very strongly negative values, which indicates strong troughing off the West Coast, which tends to mean stronger ridging east of the Rocky Mountains. And again, the CPC is showing relatively warm temperatures favored for uh, the 15th to 21st. I'm expecting temperatures to be generally above average across the state, uh, probably from the 20th through most of the rest of the month if this actually verifies. Uh, the good news though is there's definitely gonna be some chances of uh, monsoonal moisture getting into the high plains. So that would actually mean uh, some chances for additional pre precipitation across Western Nebraska. Uh, the drought monitor author, I did ask for a lot of degradation this week and a lot of inclusion of abnormal dryness and some expansion of drought and severe drought across portions of Panhandle. That was thankfully granted uh, given the very dry conditions and very hot conditions the last 30 to 45 days across a lot of the state. Uh, speaking of heat, 
The 23rd and 5th of August had to feature the highest maximum temperature average on record in the Panhandle Climate Division. Generally relatively warm everywhere else in the state as well. And again, veg dry is showing very stressed rangeland conditions across a lot of Panhandle High Plains region. Some stress to crops and even joining to show some stress on crops across portions of southeastern Nebraska as well. Generally very good conditions across the United States though. Uh, quick dry also shows some of this recent dryness in a couple spots right around holders and south of Geneva uh, might be of, of interest to take a look at see how much stress there actually is on rain fed crops in that in those areas. Soil moisture has dropped precipitously across most of the state in the last uh, 30 to 45 days. Not doing a particularly good job in portions of Panhandle, but I think this is relatively directionally correct everywhere else in the state. Uh, we did pick up some nice precipitation though Wednesday night and Thursday morning across western Nebraska and some welcome rain across portions of eastern Nebraska as well. Stress degree days running right around average across most of eastern and central Nebraska, maybe a little bit below here, well above western Nebraska. Soil temperatures mostly in the mid 70s to low 80s, and this is our temperature precipitation roundup for the last week. Thanks, and back to you, Alex. All right, thanks, Eric. And finally, today I mentioned we're in the home stretch of the growing season. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, some producers may already be thinking about late season or final irrigation strategies. Our team caught up with Nebraska Extension Irrigated Cropping Systems educator Steve Melvin out in the field to discuss just that. And Market Journal's Mike Straub has more. Scheduling the last few irrigations of the season deserves extra attention because the goal is not only to focus on keeping the crop wet enough to produce optimal yields, but also on using stored up soil water. We're near the end of the growing season. You know, here we are the first week or so of August and, and uh, we need to really start thinking about 30 days out uh, to the end of the irrigation season when our crop will be mature and start using up some of that stored soil water. Earlier in the season, you know, around uh, tassel, pollination time for corn, you know, a lot of times we can be two inches a week or something with uh, water use, but we're clear down uh, when we get to dough stage or such a matter to about an inch and a quarter a week. So we really need to start thinking about it 30 days out and start using up some of that stored water. For field capacity 30 days out, we want to start uh, just delaying the next irrigation a little bit and use up some of that water so we can, uh, you know, have the soil as dry as possible and not hurt the yield. I mean, of course, that's the the most important thing is to keep the yield there, but we want to have the soils as dry as we can going into fall. Yeah, the only thing to kind of keep in mind with soybeans versus corn is that, you know, soybeans mature pretty much based on the calendar where the sun's at is where corn is a growing degree day type of thing. And so the water use would be about the same for corn, whether it's a cool uh, August or a hot August. It'll just mature a little quicker if it's hot. Uh, the water use will be about the same and so kind of keep that in mind that you know the beans will mature pretty much on the calendar the corn it's based on uh, just how warm a conditions it is so there's just a little bit of difference between corn and soybeans university of nebraska extension irrigation scheduling recommendations encourage irrigators to allow the crop to continue using more and more of the stored soil water starting in august and continuing into september when the crop is mature yeah, you know, I, I, we've often said, you know, calculating the last irrigation of the season, but I really like to back up about 30 days before uh, black layer and start thinking about it then, because what we really don't want to do is have the soil at, at profile at, at the dent stage and then just walk away from the field and not put any irrigation water. We want to slowly use up that deeper water down at four feet that we want to use up late in the season. So it's best about 30 days before black layer or maturity of the crop to start using up that stored water and not just wait until the last minute. I mean, the pivot doesn't care if it goes around on September 10th. I mean, you know, we may not want to irrigate anymore, but the pivot really doesn't care. So if we if we kind of delay it, assuming there be, might be some rain come, it does still rain in the end of July and September. And so, you know, we just kind of start slowing down. Procrastination is not good on too many things on the farm, but that, you know, last few irrigations might be an exception to that and procrastinate a little bit. And then, you know, if you got to run the pivot around on 10th of September because it didn't rain and you're needing some water, start it up and use it. But that's better than leaving the field really wet. Um, you know, if we leave the field wet, we, we get a wet fall, which this year may be a time, you know, we're looking at so far this growing season, we could end up with a wet fall. Uh, you know, if the field is really dry, uh, you know, without affecting yield, we can get more rain without having to, you know, mud the crop out. Also, another really important thing is that we get, um, you know, in that uh, central part of the state, Grand Island or something, you know, about 13, 15 inches of water over the off season you know, from harvest or black layer until about the middle of May uh, when the crop really starts using some water. Even out in the pan, it's like eight and a half inches. And so, you know, this, a good silt loam soil can only hold about five and a half inches if we use it to that 
level we talk about and, and a sand is only a couple inches. So if we can use up as much as we can, it'll store more of that. And if it doesn't store it, it deep percolates. And of course, then it takes some nitrogen with it too. So there's lots of good reasons in addition to just saving water and money to, to really pay attention to irrigation late in the season and, and leave the soils as dry as we can. So just how much water do you need to finish out the growing season? Consider trying the irrigation meter calculator provided on CropWatch. This app calculates the number of inches of water applied by irrigation over a given time. You know, we've got a, a NEB guide and charts out there, and there's some things in CropWatch and such that talks about the amount of water from a given growth stage to black layer with corn, soybean, sorghum, other crops. And, and so a guy really wants to take a look at that. For an example, uh, about the dough stage with corn, it takes about five inches of water, and I believe about 24 days to mature. The crop and so you can see the water gets uh, use gets quite a bit lower later in the season you know the days are shorter they're cooler and the crop's starting to senesce so the water really drops off and and we've seen that uh, you know with uh, looking at some data from the upper big blue nrd that i've analyzed each year that guys typically tend over water late in the season in fact i think in in 2017 which this year may be kind of like that one about 75 percent of the guys over watered late in the season. In other words, their soils got wetter from mid-August uh, into mid-September. And what we're really trying to do is just the opposite. We're trying to use that water up. So a guy just needs to keep in mind that water use really drops off late in the season. And soil water monitoring equipment's the best way to tell it, but also you can use other things. We've got a calculator that's uh, based out of CropWatch that, that you can put your numbers, your crop in and the maturity date and things. And, and you can kind of see what that water use is going late into the season, but it gets pretty low. You know, from that two inches, the peak in the summer, you know, it'll drop down under an inch a week when you get on later into the year. So you really need to just look up the numbers and, and uh, that information's out there. Certainly take a look at, at uh, the sources and, and see what it is late in the season. With end of season irrigation becoming closer, it is important to know that leaving fields a little drier at the end of the season will save irrigation costs, decrease leaching losses, improve soil conditions for harvest traffic, and save water for future years. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Mike Straub. All right, thanks for that story, Mike. And Steve mentioned some of those charts. You can find a direct link to all of that on the Market Journal website. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to follow us on social media and YouTube to join in on the conversation. We hope to see you right back here next week. Until next time, I'm Alex Makovica. Hope you have a great week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.